Good evening and welcome to the Council Workshop. And we have two items this evening, um, the first one of which will be a workshop on historic preservation. And we are joined um, by members of historic preservation. We have Mr. Baisley, Mr. Frederick, and Mrs. Delaware. And um, I'm just going to give a quick introduction about historic preservation, and then we'll go right over to um, Craig. But um, historic preservation was an ad hoc committee that was formed based off of a council goal that we had had last year. And through that process, they were given um, some tasks as to generate you know, an inventory of what we have that are historic significance here in Scarborough. And also, uh, with that inventory, what are some incentives that we could do to help encourage that preservation? Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over. Thank you. <coughs> Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Craig Frederick. For the next few minutes, Becky Delaware and I will be presenting to you recommendations from the Ad Hoc Historic Preservation Committee created in 2013. These recommendations seek to create an incentive-based, effective historic preservation effort for Scarborough, an old town whose history goes back to the mid-17th century. After I introduce our suggestions for an additional set of incentives, Becky will reprise and update her presentation to the Council last year of the HPC's recommended list of structures of significant historic interest. Becky, who is also president of the Scarborough Historical Society, will summarize why the structures on the 48 sites we have recommended are worthy of preservation efforts. Before launching into the incentives we suggest, please let me note that we also have been reviewing from the viewpoint of preservation old cemeteries and historic markers and monuments. Last night at our regular monthly meeting, we continued our discussion of markers and monuments. We expect to have recommendations for those before too long. We have also completed a detailed initial review of the cemeteries in Scarborough including finding by Sharman Kavitsky, one of our members, at least one new old cemetery. This has turned out to be a complex subject, the more so because the state legislature has been active the past two years and is expected to be active in the new 127th legislature. So the cemetery maintenance requirements imposed on the town, which go beyond ancient cemeteries, may well change further this year. Thus, the question is broader than historic preservation, and cemeteries will seem to require a broader incentive by the town than the HPC by itself can provide. On to the three flavors of incentives that we have identified. First, as the HPC learned at a very informative meeting with town zoning administrator Brian Longstaff, there already are in our building and fire codes useful accommodations for historic structures. Town planner Dan Bacon is, I understand, including in a draft amendment to our land use laws, explicit provision to make those accommodations available to the structures of historic interest that the council designates. This is a good example of incentive-based preservation. Second, density bonuses for projects subject to land use review are an attractive tool. Historic preservation, at a minimum, should not require giving up permitted development. This is a complex subject, again going beyond historic preservation, the more so given the large number of zoning districts in Scarborough and the many varying incentives offered. Allowing, for example, reduced frontage and setback requirements is an attractive possibility requiring careful thought Similarly, we could allow the transfer of unused bonus density. But as a good starting point, we suggest and understand that Dan Bacon is developing an incentive providing simply enough that where preservation goals are met, a historic structure simply is not counted against allowable density. We need to have incentives that are useful and thus used. Third, we've considered yeah. recommending the reduction or even waiver of town-imposed fees under land use laws. This idea has also been advanced in the Scarborough Housing Alliance, on which I also sit. Because this question has broader policy concerns, including fiscal effect, 
in coordination with, for example, housing policy. We have not thought it ripe for consideration and recommendation just yet. Please let me conclude by noting that historic preservation efforts are ongoing. We welcome suggestions and discussion from you and all others interested in historic preservation, both in identifying sites of interest and in making available incentives to encourage and facilitate preservation. We have engaged in outreach, including newspaper publicity and a public meeting with structure owners. We hope and expect the outreach, like historic preservation itself, now, will, now started, will continue into the future. One focus of outreach would be to continue to seek out property owners and developers to ask about the usefulness of specific proposed incentives and what other incentives would be useful to the important cause of historic preservation in Scarborough. Thank you, Craig. Um, did you hear any of you have any questions before we scoot over to Becky, who's going to go over some of the list for, for us? Okay. Well, I'm going to explain to you how we arrived at this list and, and why uh, some of those are on there. I'm not going to do all 48. <laughs> <laughs> we started with the house survey that the Scarborough Historical Society did uh, in conjunction with the Portland Landmarks um, in 1993-94. We ended up with 1,282 historic and architecturally significant structures in Scarborough. Those fill 10 to 12 notebooks. So we started paring down that list to try to find the most significant. We started with the 1,282 and aimed for 100. We ended up with 318. So we went back and reviewed again, aiming for 20 and ended up with 100. So we went back and reviewed again, uh, hoping to get down to 20 and ended up with 47. And at that point, we decided to stay with the 47. The 48th one was added just recently when we realized that 350 County Road, which is the Universalist Church at Lower Buxton Corner, was actually in Scarborough and not Buxton. So we added that on uh, once we realized where it sat. We've gone through some difficult decisions trying to decide which building is more significant than another building and you know, why, why is this one more significant than another one. We didn't want to base our decisions just on age, so we included factors like how endangered they might be, are they linked to a significant person, place, or event, or do they have something unique about them? So the ones that have age, we found two houses that um, were built in the 1600s. This is the Hunnewell House on Black Point Road, just below Hunnewell Hill, uh, Hunnewell Oak Hill. Um, the Red House, um, and that's owned by the town. And then we have the Manson Libby House on Manson Libby Road in the industrial part down by the bus depot. Our list also includes 13 structures from the 1700s, 23 structures from the 1800s, and 10 from the 1900s. Those that were endangered, first from neglect. Uh, the Benjamin Barn on the Pleasant Hill Road was on our list initially. And then the barn fell down, so we took that off the list. But that shows that it was uh, a building that was uh, in need of protection, um, and we just weren't quick enough. The land trust now has it, and they will be taking care of that land. Those building structures that are neglected are often the ones that have the most integrity, historically or architecturally. But then they reach a point of neglect where they can't be preserved anymore, such as the Benjamin Barn. These buildings often have many acres of land with them, so it's more sensible when somebody gets the piece of land to demolish the historic building and then use the land, which is much more profitable to them. Old buildings need constant attention. It's easy for them to fall into neglect. A few years of inattention to an old house can seriously impact its viability. Those that are endangered from demolition are usually ones that cannot be brought up to code, as code is 
for a new house without destroying the significance of it historically or the cost is too great to bring it up to code. The land, again, is more valuable than the structure. The Owen Layton property on Elmwood Avenue near the main medical campus was one building that was of concern to us because there was a lot of land there and it was an old house. Uh, we found out through Dan Bacon that the piece had been split, so the land is being used for one thing and the house is going, going to be kept on another piece of land and preserved which is something that we're, we're looking for. We want that to happen. Another building that uh, may be up for demolition is the one-room schoolhouse on Holmes Road. Um, it's being encroached by residents behind it, and it can easily become a nuisance building if it isn't maintained. Being endangered from ownership change. People who own a historic building want it and they will preserve it. When financial crisis hits or it's sold, then that's a different story. The new owners may not care about the significance, and they may gut it, tear it down, or remodel it to destroy the historic character of it. Um, at our homeowners uh, meeting that we had, uh, one of the homeowners says, if you don't want a home, old home, don't buy it. Um, you need to really care about an old building if you're going to put up with the unique or unusual characteristics like it's never plumb, it's never square, it's never tight, and it costs money to maintain it. The Southgate House on Route 1 is an example of uh, a building that's in danger because of change of ownership. I know the town is working to uh, get somebody to preserve it but we are really concerned that somebody might step in and decide that it's not worth saving, so let's demolish it and put something else up. Um, the other building that's in danger because of change of ownership is the old one-room school at Dunstan on the corner of Route 1 and the old Blue Point Road is currently up for sale. Um, it's not a big building. It's pretty much as it was when it was built inside. So any business that would move in there would probably want to gut it or remodel it. Both of those buildings, the Southgate House and the old Dunstan School, are in Dunstan. Those buildings that are in danger from zoning, um, the 1600s Manson Libby Road house is in an industrial zone. It stood there for over 300 years, but was rezoned about 35 years ago to be industrial. If and when there is an ownership change, it's a non-conforming building that would be an easy candidate for demolition. The Ralph Town property at 84 County Road in North Scarborough is another one that it sits in a business zone. It has only six acres of land. If a business buys it and wants to put a business up, they're not going to want an old house sitting next to their business. Those buildings that are on the list because of historic significance of a person, place, or event, there's the 1840s house on the Pine Point Road in the Blue Point area. It was the home of Otho Baker, who was a main artist, and it's also the home of the family that bottled spring water and sold it. 13 Dunstan Landing Road in Dunstan, was the home of a white Russian who escaped from Russia after the Communist Revolution. He was active in helping America in both World War I and World War II. Other houses are buildings that have a significance. We have two Grange Halls, one in Dunstan and one at North Scarborough, that are pretty much the same as when they were built. There are at least three structures on our list that were probably a part of the Underground Railroad, um, with, for uh, helping Negroes, slaves escaping. It also boasts the hiding place for women and children during Indian attacks. One is at Black Point, one is at Oak Hill, and one is near North Scarborough. The Foss Place on the Black Point Road near the Spurwink Road was the home of the owner of the Checkley House, which was a large hotel at Prout's Neck. 
Um, they use that land, the Fosses use that land to support the hotel. They raise their produce and so forth on that land. The Blossom Place on the Two Rod Road near the main turnpike printed pro-revolutionary pamphlets in the basement in the 1770s. Buildings that have a unique quality, of course the Benjamin Barn that is no longer was a brick barn. That was unusual. Barns are not usually built of brick. We have two remaining cobblestone houses in Scarborough, both on the Black Point Road. The one at Higgins Beach has been demolished. Even though they were built in the 20th century, they are very unique. If you look at them, you, they stand out to the eye. We have two brick structures that were former taverns, one on Route 1 near the Saco Line and one on Beach Ridge. We have a 21-room house near the main medical campus that was used by stagecoaches for stopover uh, with passengers and drivers. We have several one-room schoolhouses in three parts of the town that still have much of their own integrity. We have a form of barracks in the industrial park that was used to house men that wanted to learn to fly airplanes when the airport was down there. We also included those buildings that are on the National Historic Register. We have five buildings in Scarborough that are on the National Register. It's the Honeywell House on the Black Point Road, the former Bessie School across the road here at Oak Hill, the Winslow Homa Studio at Prout's Neck, the West Scarborough Methodist Church on Route 1 in Dunstan, and the Scarborough Historical Society on Route 1 in Dunstan. The Atlantic House, which was a big hotel at Prout's Neck, was also on the National Register, but this just shows that the National Register does not always protect. The Atlantic House was torn down in 1980, I think it was. Many of the buildings that are on uh, the list of 48 fall into several categories. The Winslow Homa Studio is on the National Register. It's connected to a famous artist. It's unique and the structure is difficult to maintain. And without Doris Homer's foresight, it could have been demolished. The Ralph Tem Place on the county road at North Scarborough is non-conforming to the zone, was a shingle mill, it was built in the late 17 to early 1800s, and it's in flux because of ownership change. We're also concerned about groups of historic buildings. Dunstan is an example. 15 of the 48 properties are located in the Dunstan area. There are additional structures in that area that were on the original house survey, the 1282, but did not make the final 48 list. Just on Route 1, from the Marsh to the Saco Line, 12 of the 48 are located there, plus there are 13 more that were on the original survey. This does not include the roads that are adjacent to it, the Broad Turn Road, the Pine Point Road, though it doesn't include uh, buildings that would be on there. Dunstan is one of the earliest settlements, and it was for a long time considered the center of Scarborough. Over the last 350 years, Scarborough has lost a lot of its historic structures. Only since the House survey in 1993, we've lost about 15% of those 1,282. We've worked hard to try to meet the mission of producing a list of significant and historic houses. Um, we thank you for giving us this time to present it, and I'd be glad to answer any questions that I can. Will we, uh, will we be able to get a list of those houses? The 48? Do we have one? Should we in a packet? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yeah. Like this. From, from back here, from Craig? Yeah. I certainly like the, the way in which you've, you've identified ways in which to promote the preservation. Those all look very viable and, and so I certainly would love to see how that develops over time. Okay. Um, well, I actually still have to have Dan go, so he's going to talk a little bit about some of those. <coughs> but was there any other questions about 
some of some of the structures. Um, I apologize, there wasn't a printed copy, but there should have been a hard copy in the in the uh, SharePoint. I, I did have a question about uh, monuments uh, and plaques. Do you uh, are those on this list, or is that separate? Separate. Okay. We've had a bit of a struggle with that, and we I think we may have had a breakthrough last night analytically and subdividing it so we can then have compartments and treat things. One of the things is, there are places, Becky just told me tonight, but on that list, we need signs. They just need signs. Right. I, you can lose some important things, but if you can memorialize them, people, yeah. I know that when I've come across them in Scarborough and not knowing the history, I've enjoyed, I've stopped and actually read them because it, to me it tells me a little bit about what went on here two or three hundred years ago. Uh, uh, and, it, and you tie it in with where else you might have lived and the history that you're aware of in New England. And so uh, it, it's, an, it's a great connection as a part of the, the history of, of Scarborough. And as Craig said, there are some historic sites that are not marked, and we need to yeah. do something about educating. Exactly. Any other questions real quick? Okay, well, we'll go ahead and let Dan run with the next piece. Sure, and I don't have a, a lot more to add because I think Becky um, and Craig did the hard part in terms of introducing all the hard work of the committee and, and how they've um, whittled down the, the structure list or the site list down to 48 high priority buildings and sites. Um, Thank you. This little overview slash outline really tries to just touch on the various uh, approaches that the committees tried to take, um, and the first three are really kind of the, I think they're what they hope to be the short-term actions that they bring can bring to the council uh, quite soon here. Um, the, the list is complete, and that list really becomes, kind of creates the eligible properties to then take advantage of what Craig referred to as this idea to have sort of a residential density credit or exception where if there's a historic structure building on a par parcel of land that could be subdivided to not count that structure and lot against what a developer could do so that they're not tempted to remove um, an old structure and put a new house there. They can get that new house on another lot within the project. So I thought that was a good idea that um, could incentivize preservation or not make it tempting to, to kind of do an entirely new project. So that's being worked on, I think we're, I'd say we're three quarters of the way through the drafting of that. Um, I've put together a proposal, the town attorney is looking at it, looking at the mechanics of it. So I think the list, um, that credit, um, if you want to call it that, and then the enabling of the building code exceptions for historic buildings also would be part of that, that package that could come to the council that's, um, that also is drafted and needs just legal review. Um, essentially, in the zoning ordinance, it would, re it would consider this new list of 48 properties to be local historic buildings that are then eligible to take advantage of exceptions that are they're pretty helpful, as Becky mentioned, to preserve original window sizes, doorway sizes um, on the exterior, which can help maintain historic, uh, the aesthetics. And also, maybe just as importantly on the inside, there are some exceptions for stairways and other things that historically were um, done differently than the current codes. So that too can be a nice incentive for preservation. So I'd expect that this could be ready for probably first reading at the first meeting in February, I'm guessing, based on where we are with the town attorney. Um, and as as it mentioned, there are a handful of properties that are up for sale. So I think the sooner the better if the council is open to these ideas to kind of get them on the books so that potential buyers of these properties can maybe take advantage of um, these exceptions and credits and flexibilities. Um, the, the few other things that I know are longer range um, are on the back side. And one actually isn't necessarily a a town incentive, but it can be a very important incentive, and that's tax credits for um, both at the federal and state level. The town can play a role in terms of helping property owners apply for um, 
to be on the National Registry of Historic Places or to perhaps establish a local historic district down the road if Dunstan's viewed as a place that, that could be appropriate or somewhere else because if you're within a local district or you're on the National Registry, you can use state and federal tax credits, which can be a key component for a developer um, to want to take on the challenge of redeveloping or rehabbing a historic building like the South Gate House or some Dunstan School Restaurant, something like that, where there are added costs um, that go along with uh, rehabbing such a building, but these tax credits can kind of help overcome that. So um, that's something the town can play a role in, though we're not the, the lead agency on that. Um, and then some other things that we learned from some conversations with the main historic preservation folks at the state, um, which include you know, perhaps a local option property tax reimbursements and some other things that we really just heard about and need to learn more about to see if they're something the, the committee and the council wants to consider at a future date. So um, I think the committee wants to take some good, important first steps and then see how that uh, evolves and is used. And then if things are successful, you know, maybe there's some additional steps that can be taken. So. Thank you. Dan, was there... Any questions for Dan about some of those topics? Uh, is relocation as an incentive to a developer uh, practical in in zoning, uh, where the developer would actually relocate the property to either someplace else on the site? You talked about large tracts. Uh, Relocating the historic structure. Yes. We Certainly has been arch. done. Um, we could do the arch. Yeah. You know, the, the relocation <laughs> of, of buildings in the 1700s was common. Right. I mean, so it's it's not an unheard of concept. It, it doesn't destroy the integrity of of the historic structure. Uh, so that's why I, yeah. I I mention it. It may prove to be a way in which to get developers to buy in if all they have to do is relocate it. Because usually, it might, if it was in the farm, it might sit right in the center and be quite a detriment to the development of the property. But if it could be relocated nearby, that's a good point. I just throw that up. Okay. Yeah. I think that's something to talk further about. We we did discuss it, and it's not okay. in, in front of us at the moment. <laughs> but um, we did touch base on it, and it was Craig's comments that there might be useful to have that kind of gray room mm -hmm. um, at the planning board level, um, even again maybe similar to like with the cell phone towers where there is a little give or take as long as you're within range if it's mm -hmm. in, you know, to the discretion of the planning board um, to make the accommodations within a large project like that. Um, I don't think we have any language for it, but it's kind of a similar concept mm -hmm. I would think that Certainly, we can explore and, and hunt down some more recommendations. Yeah. Part of that is, uh, I think this is the requirement that's currently in place, is the planning board has the applicant identify historic structures on the property and um, provide a discussion as to what they can do, if anything, to preserve them on site. An example of that is the old Danish village. Mm -hmm. uh, there are two structures that remain on that property. The current uh, owner and developer of that property, they sit right in the middle, frankly, where the footprint of their building is to go. So they really don't have the abilities to maintain them on, at least at the current locations on the site. Mm -hmm. In that instance, the town has expressed some interest in working with them on their development timeline and possibly removing them uh, to another location. Uh, so that conversation can be uh, had at the planning board level by identification of those historic structures and what the developer can do or someone else can do um, with their cooperation. Do, go ahead. <laughs> do we have any uh, rules that we follow in determining what's a historic preservation building, uh, land, and then once it's determined that, who makes that determination? You know, is there federal and state laws that have to be followed? It sounds to me like this is really kind of sitting on the end of a branch, not very well protected. 
for you guys saved in this. Really, that's what it comes down to. And we've given you a rationale for these 48. We didn't think 1,200 would fly. <laughs> <laughs> I think by establishing the 48 list, at least initially, and incorporating that into the zoning ordinance, that gives local teeth, that gives recognition of these properties and uh, doesn't impose requirements, it might actually open opportunities by way of incentive for those to be preserved. But I think you're quite right. At this point, we are powerless, essentially. Mm -hmm. It was, <clears throat> I guess I should say too, the, the directive that came came to Historic Preservation and the Ad Hoc Committee was to encourage. It wasn't necessarily you know, to enforce or, or to require. It was what can we do to encourage. Um, certainly, you know, any proposal that came from that is it's an encouragement tool. Um, the list, as far as the original list, was done in the 90s. Um, Becky could probably speak a little more clearly as to th th there was a grant received from the state of Maine to, for, to Scarborough through the Historical Society, and they had um, a trained professional come in and did the survey of the entire community. So when we came in as a committee, we had the survey to start from as a starting point, um, and we just literally thought there was 10 volumes of books and started flipping through them to figure out what's even still here, what hasn't significantly changed. You know, my, my home's a good example. I, I wouldn't be on that list. I've too substantially changed the building at this point. So, you know, so it, it was, wasn't just kind of driving around and cherry picking. There is a criteria that, that was followed for the initial survey. Um, and then we just formed as a group to say, and what's the most important, what's the most significant out of all of that? So the original plan was to identify the properties. Mm -hmm. That's been done. So now the next step is to protect the properties. As to, would come to council, yes. Right. The question is how to do that. And the, the right. approach that's taken is through incentives. Yeah. And I think it will be clearer once Stan's done his draft and then you see the package of zoning amendments that includes the list, but also includes kind of the so what? You know, what does that mean? Mm -hmm. uh, and it, the approach today has been incentive-driven, not uh, enforcement Do we? or requirement. Mm -hmm. Are we going to get those reviewed by council? Yeah, that's what's occurring right now. Is um, legal counsel is reviewing the structure of the zoning ordinance, the incentives that would be established for what is on the list. Oh. And there's also been some conversation about. Uh, a narrative of what the selection criteria is, as, as Becky kind of outlined earlier and Jessica followed up on, is how did the list get established? What what are the criteria? What are the year kind of criteria mm -hmm. to make it historic or historical value? And I think a lot of hard work has been done on that. It's more a matter of just maybe more clearly documenting it. Um, and as Tom said, this is voluntary, incentive-driven, so it's not like what a lot of communities have. They, they have historic districts where there's a design review process and you're, it's more of a restrictive approach. This is a how can we tempt you or, or bait you into preserving the structure um, through incentives and kind of tax credits and voluntary efforts. So there's no way for us to protect the structure that's privately owned if somebody wants to tear it down. Not with not these under proposals. this proposal. No, it's more of a, um, currently. Currently, no. The, the National Register doesn't no. uh, provide that protection either. So anybody could tear tear a, a place down. Mm -hmm. Yes. No. Okay. Under the the present situation we have, yes. There is not even a demolition demolition permit requirement in Scarborough. Which many other towns Well, there's not a have. demolition delay. There's a demolition permit but not a right. not a delay. Often there's for historic structures, there's a time frame that someone has to wait to go through a process. Uh, Jess's comment about you know having an historic structure that gets modified uh, and doesn't any longer qualify necessarily as an historic structure. You know the the coastal communities have some pretty old structures. Uh, 
mostly dating from 1900 to 1920 or 1930. Uh, Higgins Beach Association looked at the qualification of the, that neighborhood, which has a unique cottage sense to it, uh, uh, with the National Register. Mm -hmm. uh, but the assessment of the representative in Augusta was too much had changed. But yet, we have a phenomenon going on at Higgins Beach and probably maybe other beaches, I don't know, where demolition is the rule, land's expensive, so knock down the building. So I don't know whether that could fit into an incentive-based situation uh, where they're not on the list of 48, but people could, could maybe qualify for, because I know we're looking at rezoning, some rezoning uh, in the coastal communities because they don't conform with their, their present zoning in any fashion. So, so when we're doing it, whether we could benefit from trying to promote the preservation of structures that even though they have changed somewhat, doesn't matter. They still would we benefit from having that 1920 or 1930 structure remain and be re renovated rather than demolished. Mm -hmm. I just I throw that out because <coughs> Dan's familiar with the, the coastal rezoning that we've looked at, and the, the two look like there's a little bit of connection. Yeah. Is there any other quick questions? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming very down and, and making this presentation, and thank you for your work over the last year. It's been successful. We're going to have just a minute here to kind of swap out, and then we do have another workshop this evening on a tax-acquired parcel.